Well, welcome to Front Range. My name is Ernest Smith. I'm the lead pastor, and we're so grateful that you guys are here. Whether you're joining us in person, or maybe you're in the courtyard, or maybe you're watching at home, we're grateful to have you. And our hope and prayer is that this will become a home for you, a place where you can build community, discover your purpose, and grow in your faith in Jesus. Uh, now, I want to let you know about something that's happening in a couple of weeks. On September 24th, so two Sundays from today, uh, we're doing a Parent Connect Night. Uh, this uh, Parent Connect Night is about uh, getting parents connected to one another in relationship with one another. Also, uh, we always do a training at these things. We're going to do a training on how to parent uh, with mental health uh, of an understanding of mental health and how that uh, is impacting your kids and the families and all of that, which I think is a massive, massive topic. Uh, so I want to encourage you, if you're a parent, man, join us. September 24th, uh, you can get more information uh, at our events page on our website or uh, the, the Connect card that uh, Pastor Johnny just talked about and the worship guide. There's a QR code. You can register there. Uh, but man, don't miss it. It's going to be a powerful night, not just of connecting with one another, but also understanding how mental health impacts our parenting and, and all of that. So check that out. Uh, now, how many of you, by show of hands or uh, screams, are excited that football's back? Anybody? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That means like... Uh, most of you are Broncos fans because you didn't yell very much. Um, yeah, I mean, I love football. I like, I love this time of year. I love when this time of year comes around. Uh, I, I, I like the NFL, but, and I'm a Broncos fan. I have been since I was eight. Uh, somebody texted me after last service, like, you claim the Broncos? I'm like, yes, not just in good times, but also in very, very bad times. Um, and, but what I love more than the Broncos and NFL is college football. And Georgia is my team. I love college football. And let me tell you a few reasons why I love college football. I love it because you can't lose six games like the 2007 Giants and still win the championship. Like, you can't do that. You lose one game, you're probably out. You lose two games, you're definitely out. There's almost no chance of you winning anything. And I love it because almost everything is a game changer. Right? Like anything could happen and it could change not just the game, but the course of your season. Right? Like if your coach gets suspended or if you hire a coach like primetime and you see you, but yeah, come on, see you fans. There's a lot more of you now than there were <laughs> six months ago. Let me just tell you that uh, right there. But uh, so, you know, coach, something happens with your coach or if a quarterback, you know, gets injured or if a team gets the flu or what, like anything could change the game. And if it changes the game, then it can change the entire season. I love that because anything can be a game changer. Uh, today, we're going to be starting a new series over the next six weeks. We're going to be talking about this idea of being a game changer and how you and I can change the world around us, how we not only change our own lives, but we can change our community, our states, and the world that we live in. We talked about this in a message a few weeks ago, and we talked about how all of us long for our world to be better. We all want our community to be better, and we want to do something about it, but what do we do? And so over the next six weeks, we're going to be talking about certain principles that I believe if you and I actually implement these principles, that we will see changes not only in our own life, but we will see changes in the community around us. Here's what we're going to do over the next six weeks. We're going to be studying a, a primarily a portion of Scripture in the book of Acts. Uh, we're going to be looking at a guy of, of his life and his ministry of this guy named Paul. Uh, so if you have your Bibles, you can go and turn to, to Acts chapter 9. And I want to let you know that we do a message series hub with every series that we do. What does that mean? It means you can scan your QR code. You can go to uh, your app on the phone. You can go to our website, whatever. And you can find these series hubs that we do where we give you uh, a ton more resources to just go deeper in your faith. If you want to study more about the book of Acts, if you want to follow along with a reading plan with us, anything like that, you can get all of that at these series hubs uh, that we provide for you. Now, Acts is the fifth book of the New Testament. Uh, and this was some, it's one of the most fascinating books in the Bible, in my opinion. Uh, Acts uh, tells the story of the early church, uh, how the church started, its growth, some of its challenges, its miracles, um, things that were happening, and how the people were being persecuted, and the growth that happened through all of that. Uh, where we pick up with the story today is the church is thriving. It's growing at um, some pretty incredible pace at this point. People are coming to Christ and, and, and all of that, but it, there's major persecution as well. Now, I would say that the church is growing because of the persecution. 
None of us like persecution, uh, but it actually enhances what the church is doing. And that's the case where we pick up today. The apostles at this point, they're the ones leading the charge. They're the ones that are defending the gospel. They're defending the faith. They're proclaiming the gospel to to other places around uh, the known world at that time. They're also the ones that are being beaten, imprisoned, uh, even killed at the same time. Now, the people who are persecuting the Christians at this point, there's two groups. The first group are the Romans, uh, and the Roman authorities are persecuting the Christian church because the Christians worship this king named Jesus instead of the emperor. Instead of putting emperor as their worship, they worship Jesus, and the Romans didn't like that. But the main culprits of the persecution are the Jews, and specifically the religious leaders called the Pharisees. Now, out of all the the Pharisees that were persecuting the church at that point, there was one guy who was um, uh, doing it at the highest clip uh, and the the most devastating. Uh, His name was Paul or Saul. Now, if you grew up in the church, I need to make sure I bring some clarity. If you grew up in Sunday school, maybe you were taught that, that Saul was his name, and then he converted over to Christianity, accepted Christ, and then God changed his name to Paul, but that's not true. In fact, look at Acts chapter 13, verse 9. Here's what we read. Then Saul, who was what? Also called, say that with me, then Saul, who was also called Paul. He was also called Paul. So his name was never changed. He just had two names. Now, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense for us. Why did he have two names? It's because he was a Jewish Roman. He had citizenship as both a Jew and as a Roman. It would be like if you were born to American parents in another country or if you were born in another country and you came here and became a U.S. citizen, you would have citizenship in both. Well, in that day and age, if you were a Jewish Roman and you had two names, Saul was his Jewish name and Paul was his Roman name. When we meet him, we meet him as Saul because we meet him as a Jewish religious leader. So, of course, that's the name they're going to use. But later on, as he uses his name name Paul, it's because he's ministering to non-Jews. So, bottom line is, if you ever hear Paul or Saul, they're the exact same guy. Now, unlike his colleagues who really didn't want much to do with this, this group called The Way or Christians, Paul uh, met Christianity head on. He hated Christians, and so he was the first one to persecute, the first one to arrest, the first one to beat, even the first one to kill. And in Acts chapter 7, we see Paul um, at the killing of Stephen, and Paul was the one that gave the permission to kill Stephen for his faith. And um, in Acts chapter 8, verse 3 and 4, here's what we read. It says, but Saul began to destroy the church, going from house to house. He dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. So Paul was doing his best to destroy the church. He would go house to house, arresting people, beating them, and then ultimately killing them. Paul was doing his best to destroy the church, but because he was going house to house and the people began to scatter, and as they scattered, they would preach the gospel. Instead of destroying the church, Paul was actually igniting the church's growth. That's where we pick up with the story uh, today. Paul hated uh, Christians so much that he wanted to take his, his uh, hatred on the road. He didn't want to just hate Christians in Jerusalem. He wanted to go to Damascus. That's where we pick up the story. And we're going to find out how Paul went from this murderous um, hater of, of Christians to someone who planted churches all over the known world and wrote a large portion of our New Testament today. So three things that he did to change his world and the world around him. Look at Acts chapter 9, verse 1 through 4. It says, Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Now imagine being Saul at this point. You're just minding your own business. You're riding on your little little horse. You're heading into Damascus. And all of a sudden, this huge bright light happens. You fall off your horse. You're now blind. And you hear this voice talking to you. Be kind of a crazy situation if you were in that. So what does Paul do? He asks a question. He says, who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you'll be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but did not see anyone. 
So Paul's got this choice in this moment. He can act like nothing happened. Man, that was kind of weird. You know, something strange just happened. I don't get it, but I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing. Or he can acknowledge that something supernatural is happening, that God is actually trying to get his attention. I mean, this very Jesus that he's telling everyone else not to believe in is now speaking to him, saying, Paul, I need you to believe in me. Paul has a choice. Does he choose to have faith and believe in in this, this resurrected Jesus, or does he choose to deny his existence? Well, Paul makes his first, his first choice, and the first thing that you and I must do to change our world or the world around us, and that's submit your life to Jesus. The first thing, if we want to change our world and change the world around us, is we've got to submit our life to Jesus. I was talking with a guy um, a, a while back, and this is a conversation I have uh, quite often, uh, but this guy, he's just struggling. He's uh, got some things going on in his marriage. Um, he's got some addictions happening. He's uh, got some depression. He was suicidal. It was a pretty heavy conversation. He said, man, what do I do? Like, like give me like the three steps of what I can do to get out of this situation. I said, look, man, I can't tell you all that. The first thing I can tell you, though, is you need to give your life over to Jesus. Like, you need to submit your life to him. What does that mean? It means acknowledging that you're a sinner. All of us are. The Bible says that every person is a sinner. What is that? A sinner is somebody who doesn't measure up to God's perfect standard. So unless you're perfect, which I don't think any of us are, then you're a sinner. And your sin, the result of sin is death. The punishment of sin is death. Well, Jesus took that punishment on himself. He died on the cross for you and I so that we could be saved. So it's acknowledging what Jesus did on the cross for us, that he took the punishment that we deserve to take. And then it's receiving that. And then it's making Jesus Lord of our lives. It's submitting our life to him. It's not just saying with our mouths that Jesus is Lord. That's easy to do. It's easy for anybody to say, oh, Jesus is Lord of my life. In fact, in Matthew chapter 7, Jesus says, you say Lord, Lord, but I never knew you. And so it's easy for us to say, well, Jesus is Lord, but unless your life is submitted to him, it's just, it's just words. And so this guy said, well, why would God forgive me? I talked about, you know, how God wants to forgive him and all of that. And God chooses to through Christ. And he said, why would he? And I said, because God loves you so much. Like you can't fathom the depth of God's love for you and I. That was hard for him to grasp. I think it's hard for some of us to grasp. Like it's hard to understand that a a God loves us so much. Not because we don't want to believe it, but because we're carrying so much weight right now. It's hard to think about anything else, anything else other than the weight that we have. Like some of us, we're carrying the weight of the world on our shoulders. We're carrying the weight of sin. We're carrying the weight of addiction. We're carrying the weight of providing for our family, of whatever it may be. And you know who you are because you feel it. It's heavy. And you walked into this place feeling heavy. And God didn't design you to carry that weight. God didn't design you to carry that on your own. God designed you to come to him, to submit your life over to him, to give your life fully to Jesus. Say, hey, man, I don't understand it. I don't fully get it, but I'm going to trust in you. God, here's my life. I'm going to submit my life over to you. I'm going to say that you are now Lord of my life, and I'm going to live accordingly. And then God gives you exactly what you need. He gives you the forgiveness that you long for. He gives you the healing that you long for, especially from your past mistakes and the regret and the guilt and the shame and all of that. God will give you exactly what you need when you need it, but it's us coming to him and submitting our life over to him. That was the first step that Paul had to take. He had to first say, okay, you know what? I've been doing this religious thing on my own. Like he was a religious guy, but religion doesn't get you saved. Religion doesn't get you into heaven. Religion doesn't get you a relationship with God. Paul had religion. He was doing all these things because that's what he was taught to do or because that's what gave him prestige and honor and power and all of those things that, that most humans want at some level. So Paul had all of that because of his religion. And God's saying, put down the religion. I want a relationship with you. So Paul's first step to change his own world and the world, world around him was to give his life to Jesus, to submit completely to him. 
After this experience, Paul goes to Damascus. Now imagine, he's blind at this point from this, from this experience that he's just had. He goes to Damascus, and God calls on this guy named Ananias to go pray over Paul. And Paul's learning the second thing that you and I have to do to change our world and the world around us, and that's surround yourself with other followers of Jesus. Surround yourself with other followers of Jesus. So God calls Ananias to go to Paul, and here's what we read, verse 11. The Lord told him, Ananias, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Now imagine being Ananias. Imagine God speaking to you in such clear direction. Like, hey, Ernest, I want you to go to Wilcox. And when you go to Wilcox, you're going to go to this person's house, and you're going to meet this person from this particular place, and this person's already had a dream about what you're going to do, and I want you to go and do that thing. I'd be like, oh, yeah, well, that seemed pretty clear to me to, to what you want me to do. I can do that. But Ananias is like, oh, I don't know, man. I don't think I want to do that, God. Why? Because he knew Paul's reputation. You want me to go find this guy named Paul who's been imprisoning and beating and killing your followers, God? You want me to go find him and pray over him? Are you crazy? That sounds a little, a little ridiculous. But Paul needs community. He needs people to pour into him. He needs to be around other believers who will love him and serve him and care for him. In fact, right after he gives his life, to Christ and Ananias goes over there, prays over him. He's healed of his blindness. This is what we read. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. So Paul submits his life over to Christ. He's healed of this, uh, of this blindness that he has. And the first thing that God wants him to do is to surround himself with other followers of Jesus. Why? Because God didn't create you to do life alone. Like, God didn't wire you to do this on your own. You need other people. And other people need you. Like, Paul needed Ananias, and Ananias needed Paul. Now, I get it. I get why people would, would kind of retreat away and isolate themselves. I'm an extrovert, so, like, I get a lot of energy being around people, and I, lo I love Sundays because I get to be around a lot of people, and I, it just fuels me. But over the last three years, I found myself kind of retracting a little bit. I just seeing the stuff going on in our world and, and the brokenness of humanity and, and all of that. I'm just like, ah, I don't want to take a step back. But that's not how God created me. That's not how God created you. And I need people. And people need me. Paul needed Ananias. But Ananias also needed Paul. There are people in your life that you need. There are also people in your life that they need you. They need you. And what's the alternative? I mean, the alternative is to isolate yourself. Where does that get you? If you've ever actually isolated yourself emotionally or spiritually or relationally, you know where it gets you. It gets you into a real bad place. We've seen throughout history. You can even see in the Bible I love studying the Bible because it's full of broken people. Like if I'm God and I'm trying to like write something to you, I'm be like, I'm going to put the perfect people in there. But there's no perfect people. God's like, look, you're all broken and messed up. And so when you look throughout Scripture and you see these people that begin to isolate themselves, what do they start to go through? They start to, to deal with isolation and depression, suicidal thoughts, all of the things that we deal with. Why? Because you were never made to live life on your own. God created you first to have a relationship with him and then a relationship with others. That's how he created you. And it's why we talk about community so much here at Front Range. In fact, today we have a bunch of um, uh, uh, booths out in the courtyard, and uh, we call this a, a community group fair. We give you an opportunity to join a community group if you're not already in one. Or if you're in one, you're like, eh, I'm not really a big fan of these people. It's okay. We can help you find another one. Uh, but community is so important. Like you need it. And it needs you. And so we have all these different community groups. We've got women's groups and men's groups and couples and a variety of different. We have all types of groups to say, just try one. Now here's the deal. If you try one, you're like, I tried it for a couple weeks. I just, I, you know, it just wasn't for me. 
Like, a couple weeks isn't long enough. I hear that all the time. Like, oh, man, Ernest, I just haven't been able to find community. And I'm like, oh, man, have you tried a community group? Yeah, yeah, I have. How many times did you go? I like twice. Like, what relationship do you have that you're close with that you only had to show up twice? Right? Like, none. Zero. So you have to fight for it. And it's messy, and it can be hard, and all of that. And if you're like, man, I'm not even sure this is my church. We have this thing called Next Steps. We have one tonight, but it's actually full. Uh, so our next one is in November. Sorry for that. Uh, but you could have signed up before today. Uh, and uh, you, you would sign up now. I would encourage you, like, commit to it now. If you're, if you're like, man, I'm not ready for a group yet, but I'd re- rather try one of these other things. We also have well, women's nights and uh, um, men's breakfasts and all kinds of things that are happening. You can look on our events page. I'm telling you, the best way to dive into community is through community groups. It's through joining a men's group or a women's group or a couple's group or something like that to go, hey, man, I need people and people need me. But here's what I'll say. I think we make community more complicated than it needs to be. I think we make it harder than what we need it to be. Like, like I know people that will say, well, I want community, but I need some, I need a group where like, you know, everybody's married and they have like 2.5 kids and they have a dog that doesn't shed that's under 25 pounds. They're not Raiders fans. You know, like I, like, I, I need all of these certain things. I'm like, I, I get the last one, but like all the other ones, like, like grow up in the ni- growing up in the 90s, I was taught, I accepted Christ later in the 90s and I was taught like, have a list for your wife. Like what kind of wife do you want? Have a list of all the things she's got she's to meet to before you marry her and all that. Like, okay, maybe for marriage, even though I question that at times, but, but with community, you can't do that. That's crazy. You'll never find community. So what are you looking for? Like to not make it so difficult and so complicated, what are you looking for? You're looking for people that are going to help you become more like Jesus. It's really simple. You're looking for people who are going to help you get closer to God, to look more like Christ, to get closer to God. So just ask that question. Are the people in my life helping me to get closer to God? I have a really simple illustration. I saw this uh, when I was like 17 years old. Um, I I saw this kid playing with balloons, and uh, it kind of struck me. And so I'm going to kind of show you what that looks like. So let's say that these two balloons, they both have helium in them. In them. Uh, let's say that the healing represents people who have accepted Christ, right? Like, and you're going the same direction. You want the same things in life. You want to pursue after God. I'm not talking like people who, you know, like, oh, did you vote the same, you know, or you, wh- whatever. Like, I'm talking about people who love Jesus and you're both pursuing after Jesus. That's what the healing represents. And when you tie yourself to people like that, then you go up, right? You get closer to God. It's pretty simple. Like that, that one we get. But what happens so many times is that we tie ourselves to somebody who doesn't have the same desire to meet Christ, to go after Christ, to pursue after him. And what happens to the person who it does have the helium is they're brought down all the time. Like I remember when I was a youth pastor, we would tell our students, like, don't, don't be a missionary dater. Like, don't date thinking you're going to help people come to know Christ. Like, sure, I get it. That works every once in a while. But the majority of times, that does not happen. And it's the same with friendships. Like, you want lost people in your life for sure. You need those people in your life because God wants to use you. And we'll talk about that in a second. But to attach yourself to people who are not going after the same thing as you, it will only bring you down. And it will keep you from going any higher And eventually the helium is lost and this just sinks down and you end up at the same place as them. Like we think we're going to bring them up, but it never works that way. They just bring us down. And so when you're looking at the relationships in your life, besides your marriage, if you're married to somebody that's not a believer, you're supposed to serve them, love them, care for them. We can help with that. I had a guy right after last service. He's like, hey, man, I'm an atheist. My wife loves this church. I come because I love her. I don't know where to go. I don't know what to do. So him and I are going to be grabbing lunch. We're going to be walking through a book together. And I believe firmly he's going to come to Christ. So, like, if you're married, like, you don't detach yourself because of that situation. But other than marriage, don't attach yourself to people that are not going after Christ like you want to go after Christ. 
Don't attach yourself to people that aren't pursuing Jesus like you want to pursue Jesus, like you should be pursuing Jesus. Because when you attach yourself to people who are like-minded, going in the same direction, going toward God together, you can go higher. Always go higher together. You got to attach yourself to the right people. So Paul understood this. He understood that to change the world around him, he had to give his life to Jesus, submit his life completely over to him, surround himself with other followers, and then lastly, step out in faith. Step out in faith. I love that Paul surrounded himself with other followers of Jesus, that he gave his life to Christ and all of that. But look what he does right after he surrounds himself with followers. In verse 20, it says, at once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the son of God. At once. Say at once. At once. Paul doesn't say, hey, you know what, man, I got to go get a seminary degree first. Or, you know, I, I got to like learn a lot more about this Jesus guy first or whatever. Or, you know, let me be, let me, let me have a relationship with Christ for, you know, about five years first. And then I'll go start preaching in the synagogues. No, it says at once, immediately he starts preaching the gospel. Why? Like, why does Paul have such an urgency? Like, why doesn't Paul wait? I don't think, I think if Paul waited, I don't think God would have been like, ah, man, I'm really disappointed in you. I don't think God would have done that. So why does Paul push it? Why does Paul say, man, at one, I got to start preaching now? Because our world is broken. And every day there are people who are dying without Christ in their life. And if you die without a relationship with Jesus, it results in hell. And I know that's not popular to talk about. Some of you, you're like, ooh, man, that feels like my old churches or whatever. But just because it doesn't make us comfortable doesn't mean it's not true. If people die without Jesus, they spend eternity without God. And that is hell. And so, like, we should look at this world and there should be a sense of urgency. Like, I've got to do everything I can to help people come to know Christ. Because this world is broken. And day after day, there are people every day who are struggling. There are people every day who are, who are caught in addiction. There are people every day who are struggling in, in some sin in their life. There are people every day that are struggling with hopelessness or depression or suicidal thoughts. Every day, there are these people. Every day. And some of us, we're in here today, and you're like, man, that's me. I think about Castle Rock, Douglas County as a whole. Historically, we've had one of the highest suicide rates for teenagers. Like, if that doesn't break your heart, I don't know what will. We have the second highest suicide rate for men between the ages of 40 and 55. In the country, the second highest. We're losing too many men, too many fathers, too many husbands to suicide, too many kids to suicide. That's just one thing. That's not the addiction and the depression and all the other things that we can see in our community right around us. The world needs you. The world desperately needs you to act now, not wait. The problem with our society is that it's built around me. It's built around you. So we're taught to do whatever is good for us, whatever is good for me, rather than going, okay, God saved me, and if God saved me, what is mine to do now? What is mine to do? It's to take action in my faith because I have to be urgent because the world needs Jesus now. I think about Paul. Like, what was his first few sermons like? Like, he's up there preaching. Like, what does he preach on? He doesn't really know Jesus all that well. Right? Like, there's no New Testament at this point that he can study like we have. Like, what, what is he preaching? Ah, oh, well, you know, I mean, there was this one time I was riding a horse. And it's like crazy light struck me. And I became blind, and this voice started talking to me. Like, that sounds crazy. He just started sharing his story. He just started sharing what God had done in his life. Like how God had met him where he was at the deepest moment of need. And how God loved him so much that he spared him. 
He gave him grace, offered him forgiveness. And it's really that simple for us. You don't have to be a pastor. You don't have to have gone to seminary or none of that. You have a story. If you've accepted Christ, you're surrounding yourself with other believers and you're going closer to God. And you have a story that the world needs, desperately needs. Think about Paul. He could have said, I don't, I don't have I don't have the education. I don't have the experience. It'd be real easy for us to say, oh, I don't have. It would have been real easy for him to say, but, but I am. I'm a, I'm a murderer. I persecuted God's church. How could people trust me? Think about the guilt and the shame of killing somebody else for the same faith he now has. It'd be real easy for us to say, but I, look at my past. I am this. How could God use me? I'm glad Paul didn't have any of that mentality and my prayer is that you wouldn't either because God wants to use you. Maybe for some of us, the first step is to submit our life over to Jesus. Maybe you're in that place where, and you're, you're just carrying so much weight. You've been doing it on your own and realize you just can't. And for some of us, our next step is to get in community, to make sure you're surrounding yourself with other believers we are going to help you get closer to God, grow in your faith. And then when we have accepted Christ, all of us, we need to take a next step of faith. What is God calling you to do? The world needs you, and it needs you now. Let's pray. Father, we come before you, and I thank you for your word. I thank you for Paul's life. God, that you didn't just show us a bunch of stories of perfect people, but of brokenness, of pride, of regret, all the things that we all deal with. God, that you could do something so great in Paul's life that you want to do the same in mine. You could take this guy who wasn't just a non-believer, he was a persecutor of your church and use him to plant churches and to write a large portion of the New Testament that we now read today. That God, we're sitting here today with the faith that we have because of Paul. <laughs> God, I pray that you would use all of us like that. And for some of us, Father, our first step is giving our life over to Jesus. Some of us, we came into this place and we'd say, man, I, I have been carrying the weight of the world. The weight of my sin or the weight of providing for my family or the weight of just the junk that's going on in my life. If you haven't fully submitted your life over to Christ, what better time than right now? Again, it's recognizing that we're all sinners. That God died on the cross for our sin doesn't mean that you're not going to have questions or doubts. It just means that you're going to choose to take a step of faith today to commit your life or recommit your life over to Jesus. Not let it just be words, but saying, okay, I'm going to make him Lord of my life. I don't fully understand what that means, but I'm going to take that step today. So if that's you with every head bowed and eyes closed, if you'd say, man, Ernest, today I want to, I want to give my life over to Jesus. I want to commit my life or recommit my life to Christ. I just want you to raise a hand right now. I want to know who to pray for. Amen. 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 Father, thank you for each one of these individuals. Thank you, God, that you know their name, you know their story, and you love them deeply. If you're watching at home, you can just text the word follow to the number on the screen. God sees you. He knows you. And God, I just say thank you. Thank you for their decision. Be brave enough. Thank you for your grace and your mercy. And then, God, for all of us, tell us what our next step is, God. For those of us who maybe have attached ourselves to people that are not bringing us up, God, may today be a step in the right direction to put ourselves in better community. Father, for some of us who and we have the right community around us or we've accepted Christ, maybe we haven't been taking action in our faith, may today start a new journey of us saying, God, use me. 
Use me, God, in this broken and fallen world. Help me, God, to bring hope and life to those who desperately need it. God, just speak to each one of us. Tell us what to, what to do next. In Jesus' name, amen.